Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Independent Whiskey Show, Independent Bottlers Virtual Whiskey Show. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two guests live from the UK, uh, Sam Simmons, Dr. Whiskey, and, and Dave Worthington. Uh, I'll just read out their, their bios. Uh, I can't uh, uh, rely on my memory. Um, so Sam, Dr. Whiskey Simmons, is a whiskey educator, communicator, whiskey blender, keeper of the quake, and he joined Atom Brands in 2018, worked with William Grant and Sons before as global brand ambassador for Balvenie uh, since 2010. Uh, prior to that, worked at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society and the Whiskey Exchange, uh, establishing himself through the groundbreaking blog, uh, Dr. Whiskey. Uh, Sam oversees the existing whiskey brands of that boutique whiskey company, Darkness, the blended whiskey company, and developing all uh, future mature liquids. Uh, Dave had a career in mechanical engineering. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's a very fine line between uh, engineering and alcohol. And uh, he turned his hobby into a passion for whiskey uh, and his career at the end of 2016. He started Whiskey Discovery blog in 2012 and is recognized as a, a website to watch in the Malt Whiskey Yearbook of 2014. And Dave was awarded an Icon of Whiskey uh, Award as World Whiskey Brand Ambassador of the Year in 2018. So Ooh. welcome, gentlemen. And welcome everybody who's, uh, who's at home uh, all over the country and sometimes internationally. Um, now, this is the launch of the Independent Bottlings Whiskey Show. Uh, those of you who are uh, lucky enough to get uh, the 200 packs that were made available, 18 whiskeys from different independent bottlers, different distilleries, some of them as old as 23, 24 years old. Now, you don't need to drink them all at once. Uh, the videos and uh, uh, the app information, uh, those of you, uh, if you haven't downloaded the app, um, it's available, the whiskey list and the app stores. Um, you just download the app. That can take you through all the whiskeys. It can, you can purchase them. Once you got good, you can sample them. Uh, being independent bottlers, which we'll find out from uh, the guys in a short while, some of them being single cask are very limited. Uh, so if you do find one that you like, you better get into the store quickly because uh, they certainly aren't going to last. So really, we're going to start off with the basics. What is it, are independent bottlers? Uh, how do they start? Uh, what's the future of them? Uh, how, do they, um, how do they fit into the whole whiskey scene? Uh, and uh, a few tricky questions in between. But uh, before we kick off, I've given both Sam and Dave a bit of homework. Oh. They are going to each tell you, the audience, a little secret, some snippet of information that nobody really knows about them. If you go into Google, you won't find out this information. And they're going to present that to you in, in secret, in private. But you have to actually figure out if it is true or utter rubbish. It's kind of a, we call it in our game of dram show, yeah, nah. And uh, you guys can vote <laughs> on the chat. And, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to say good evening, Australia. How are you all? <laughs> um, and uh, so all you do is uh, uh, you can vote on the chat whether you think that that little, little snippet, that little secret is true or not. And uh, um, at the end, uh, we'll reveal all. So um, um, Sam, would you like to go first? I struggle to find something whiskey themed that no one's going to get because it just sometimes it just sounds too realistic. And I wish I had seen some other examples that I heard some other examples of this, but let's, let's give it a try. So, um, I lived in with Inuit with, uh, Eskimos, the politically incorrect term in Northern Canada and drank a bottle of Scotch whiskey at a funeral up there while eating narwhal. Mm. Tuscan all. No, we didn't. That's a <laughs> memorial actually for the, the young man that died. Um, let me think of my lie. Um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't elaborate too much because it might give some clues whether it's yeah or nay. Okay, right. Okay. You, you, uh, use, the, you use the tusk as a toothpick afterwards, don't you? <laughs> yeah, with teeth like these. <laughs> or oh, nay. Mm. Right, Dave. Okay. Um, okay, I've got a really interesting story. Uh, well, I was a, started life as a blogger as Whiskey Discovery, and when you start blogging and you start being active on social media, as I live on Twitter, that's uh, Boutique Dave is my handle, um, I got invited up to lots of different press trips, and I was up in Edinburgh on a whiskey press trip, 
and Ch Charlie McLean. I think it's the first time I met Charlie McLean. That was back in June 2011. And they were filming in Edinburgh the um, Angel Share. Uh, the Angel Share DVD that I happen to have here in front of me. Um, and in that Edinburgh scene, when they're walking along in front of the castle, uh, there's a there's a train of um, oh, girls on a Hindu, and I'm walking the other way in the back. So I, I, a, a tiny little cameo part in there while I was there, because Charlie said, oh, come on over, we're, we're filming. And um, I, I ended up in a little cameo part in the Angel Share. And um, you can't, you couldn't recognise me easily, but I know I'm there. You know, that's that's my little claim to fame. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, in uh, another fifty-five odd minutes, uh, we'll all will be revealed. Yeah, now. Nah. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, independent bottlers. Like, uh, what are they? What what is their difference? And uh, why would you choose an independent bottling over a, a distillery bottling? And uh, um, uh, open up to uh, to either of you. Um, well, I think independent bottlers are probably the most traditional of Scottish whisky bottlers. I think that's where it all started from, wasn't it? Where where grocers were bottling distillery releases. Distilleries didn't market their own their own brands. They were sent. They produced whisky. I mean, you read whisky distilleries of the United Kingdom by this wonderful book here. Uh, most of the whiskies are being sent. They didn't have their own brand. Very few had their own brand back then, and they were just being sent to grocers, uh, and that's where a lot of the big blends have started up through through grocers. Um, you know, Gordon and McFowl, the oldest the oldest independent bottler in Scotland, started life as a, as a grocer. Um, so I think independent bottlers must have oh, it would have grown in parallel i think in in america as well with small distilleries farmsteads supplying stores and they would be you know you're buying your 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 whiskey from from a barrel effectively in a store i think that's where it probably it all started so independent bottlers for the win uh, and uh, they've been around for a long time but um uh, are being with all the increase in interest in whiskey, um, is is it now more of a challenge to try and find decent casks? Is there more pressure? Uh, are they? Uh, is the economics becoming harder and harder? Uh, we see a few independent bottlers actually starting their own distilleries um, now with supply and demand. How do how do the, the vagaries and fluctuations uh, of that part of the industry affect uh, affect the independent bottlers? You guys. The, the first thing to note, I think, is that, as Dave points out, it's this is a pretty unique thing to Scotland. And yes, we see it more and more around the world and traditions, you know, in, in Canada and in, in Australia and New Zealand of the independent bottler. But it really it starts in Scotland as a, as a recognized, credible source of, of spirits in this case. Um, you don't see it in wine. You don't see it in grappa. You don't see it in, in, in other spirits uh, really around the world. And it, it's uniquely Scotch. So why? So you know, we remember, of course, that when the glasses of the middle classes dried up of drinking brandy and cognac in the 1880s, in the UK, scotch was there to replace that. And that's blended scotch. That's scotch is, you know, malt, malt spirits mixed together with grain spirits, put in a glass, taste nice with soda, which is how most people were consuming uh, that spirit, their spirits at the time. So um, the independent bottler is there really as a, as a, as Dave points out, yeah, as like a grocer tradition, but it evolves into much more where people like Gordon McPhail are buying casts to put it out in their own livery, not in a VAT 69 or a Johnny Walker bottle where, where things get blended. And that's what most of the world thinks scotch is at that point. But locally and around these shops, uh, increasingly people are, are drinking single barrels. And that's that becomes a pretty cool, hi, a pretty cool and unique thing that allows distillers to take the risk to overproduce. And this is a really cool thing about Scotch whiskey, I think, is that they can fill with confidence because there is a secondary trusted and credible market that respects Macallan or Glen Grant or Glen Berge, uh, three examples of distilleries that, um, for ex uh, that Gordon McPhail invested heavily in many, many years ago. Um, they would buy the spirit new, put it into their own cast and release it later. It means that a distiller, if there ever is excess uh, or surplus to their demands, because it's very hard to predict 10 years, 12 years out, that uh, they, they know that there's a, somewhere they can put it. 
So to answer your, the second part of your question then, um, what's happened over really the last 200 years is whiskey has gone. We, we've seen a bit of a roller coaster up and down in popularity. And we're definitely still on a, on a very popular arc, uh, really that started probably in the 90s or the end of the 80s, at least, um, with the launch of the classic malts. But let, let's say since the 90s, been on this upward trajectory. And I just got an email today from, I think it was a website called wewantanywhiskey.com. That's the point it's got to. We have people <laughs> investing in casks as, um, as a commodity. And that is a completely different beast. That is creating a situation where we have whiskeys that people bought, let's say five years ago as an investment, and there's a pressure for them to flip that cast to make money for their customers or for themselves. And therefore these, these cast prices are wildly inflated. Um, and that's and they, they exist out with the, the existing uh, secondary market that distillers and independent bottlers like us, like McPhail's, like Signatory, like the Society, um, have established over a, a long period of time. And so there are, there are two economies going on, and it's, it, it, is, it is creating some sort of pressure. Whether it dries up supply, I don't believe so, but it's certainly driving up some prices for some people. And is there, uh, in terms of the actual process, uh, what is is the the trend to buy casks from those distilleries or buy new make spirit to put in your own casks? Is it a, is it a mix? Um, which, uh, which which is which part of it dominates uh, uh, for the people out there? Well, being an independent bottler is an expensive business, and certainly for laying down casks, it's a long time term goal. You know, Boutique Whiskey came on board in two thousand and twelve, so we're eight years old this year. So yeah, putting laying down whiskey in casks certainly wasn't in our plans right from the very beginning. Um, how that will change going forward, that may be a different thing. It's, it's very expensive. You know, we started off small and grew organically. And I think a lot of those companies have done, and there's you know, a lot of these new companies, they, they are buying casks. Um, you know, Scotch whiskey is unique in that it was built on the back of blended Scotch whiskey. And so there is this army of whiskey brokers around that look after all this surplus stocks and um that's where most of these independent bottlers have to go and get them all independent bottlers have to go and search these stocks for those those gems those those sweet spots those sweet casks those honey casks you know that's what you do you go in um, you know looking for samples and pick up Distilleries make fillings for blends. You know, ninety percent of the world still drink scotch because they like it, not because they're geeks and need to have a collection of whiskey behind them. <laughs> you know, they drink whiskey. They put a bottle on the table. They sit down with their friends with a bucket of ice and a, and a bottle of soda, and they sit there and they drink the bottle. Period. You know, and then when they go out the next time, they buy another bottle. Most people, the majority of people, drink scotch like that. Yeah, um, not with Glen Cairns. That's right. Not with Glen Cairns. No, uh, <laughs> drink it out. Drink it out of a mug. No, we don't. Um, so, you know, there, there is that unique side of Scotch whiskey for independent bottlers, um, where you can go and look through the cast of brokers. You know, all the blenders, all of the independent bottlers need to be searching these stocks for those casks that are worthy of putting in a bottle as an independent release. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, and that's that's the what we see as the uh, the, the beauty of the independent bottlers is that uh, seeking out those hidden gems um, is uh, when, when you're looking at a at a set of casks. Do you have in your mind whether a particular cask is going to be bottled as a as a single cask or or part of a part of a batch? Um, is it does that just come out of the, the flavors once you once you're sampling those casks over time? Well, Dave could speak to this a little bit because boutique widely i mean in most examples of boutique bottlings actually aren't single casks no no we never say single cask is boutique whiskey never have done and and you know right at the beginning we never even put an age statement on that there's only because people are asking and people are always asking more and more information on on everything i think the internet helps because uh, they read things and oh, I want to know what cask it's in. I mean, why do you want to know what cask it's in? What are you going to do with that information? Is it going to change the flavor then you drink it? It may help you buy it, but you know, generally you can look at a color of a, of a whiskey, certainly of independent bottlers because they do not color them, um, that you can look at the color of the whiskey and say, yeah, that's been in a sherry or a port or a wine, or the majority of casks are refill bourbon. I mean, that is obvious for the amount of 
casks that are being filled. So why do you need to know that information? I don't know. But yes, as an independent bottler, we decided a long time ago, like from the very beginning, that you know, single cask, there are plenty of independent bottlers doing single cask and cask strength. Not necessarily the best. If we have two casks and we put a bucket of that 15-year-old in that 10-year-old and it just lifts it to another level, why wouldn't you do that as an independent bottler? Uh, and it's still a 10 year old and you you used a bucket of 15 year old but it's about getting the best liquid in the bottle um and reducing it to the right strength for drinking that really shines it in its best light in our opinion and that's what good independent bottlers do you know some independent bottlers just decide that everything's going to go out at 50 percent or 46 percent um we certainly don't and there's a number of others that don't do that. They actually sit there and they taste cast samples and they marry cast samples together and think that's the that's the mix and that's the ABV and that's what we're going to go for. Yeah, yeah. what is that? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Sam, there's a uh, there's an, a body of opinion. Uh, you, you, do, do that again, please, Dave. Put the cork back in and, and, and redo it. Hey, it matches the mug. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's no better sound than a cork coming out of a bottle. That's, that's for sure. Uh, it's not. <laughs> there we go. Let's have a look. Uh, now, there's right. a statement uh, that that floats around every now and again that um, uh, independent bottlers saved the whiskey industry uh, when the whiskey industry was was uh, floundering. Um, is that do mm. do as a community of independent bottlers, is that something that uh, 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 that that is ever ever mentioned or, or uh, kind of uh, assumed? I, I, yeah, on that. yeah. My, my short answer would be bullshit. Um, but yeah. it's, it's a lovely it's a lovely romantic thought. It depends how long you're looking at the the data or or the 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 the, the narrative of that that whiskey story, because of course the example you're probably speaking of is really in the eighties when brown spirits became uh, less fashionable than vodka and cocaine. Um, and there was a, there was a, re and after a boom period of the seventies with Scotch whiskey, there was a lot of production going on. And then suddenly a bunch of eight, 12 year, eight to 12 year old whiskey. That was, there was no customer for it, uh, cause brown spirits had fell out of fashion. And yeah, in those times, independent bottlers or smaller companies or brokers were able to invest and buy some of that excess stock from the distilleries and keep those distilleries alive. But to say they saved the industry, I don't think that's quite accurate because um, the you look at an example like Diageo. Diageo um, wasn't called that at the time, let's say in the 80s, but Diageo launched um, the classic malts, I think in 1987 or 1989, I forget, but this is a way to uh, present malt whiskey, single malt whiskey as premium to blends, and in a way that was not confusing to consumers. There's an island, a highland, a space that, you know, it's spread it out like this. That did more to save whiskey than the independent bottlers, because a lot of these independent bottlers who, who are brokers who might have helped short term um, by buying that excess stock, uh, the surplus stock in the 80s, then later, we know in the last decade, sold it back to the big distillers at a great profit. So, you know, taking money from what giving money into one part of the pool, but taking much more, much later, is that saving the industry? I mean, that is one of the beautiful holistic things about Scotch whiskey for sure. And the whole, the whole ecosystem around Scotch is why we have 120 distilleries that have survived, you know, 200 years. It's, it's incredible. It's because of, yes, it's because of the secondary market, these independent bottlers and brokers. Um, but it's, it's, I, I think it'd be inaccurate to say a statement like that independent bottlers mm -hmm. saved Scotch whiskey. Okay. There was a there was a period in time where independent bottlers' name was was mud as well, wasn't there? I mean, there's this period in time at the beginning of the two thousands. Um, was it that late? Well, even even was... earlier. So remember, people started teaspooning because of bad bottlings going out. So bad Lafroigs, yeah. bad Glenfiddichs going out in the market at, under the brand names, and people started saying, well, "Fuck this! I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to put a little bit of Balvenie in my Glenfiddich so no one else can bottle it." Yeah. There was these arm, armchair bottlers. When whiskey wasn't worth anything, you know, whiskey value disappeared quite quickly when there was far too much of it. And there was a number of people, number of companies that started up as independent bottlers. And they do come and go. You, I must admit, I've seen independent bottlers come and go and, you know, they produce, produce a few nice bottlings and then just disappear and just where they're gone. Um, and and you know, there are some, uh, there, there were some uh, suspect uh, independent bottlers, which is why these distilleries shut the door, and it became very difficult for a period of time for independent bottlers. 
Um, but over time, you know, you build that trust up by by selecting the right casks, by making sure you don't put any rubbish out, like you taste everything that you do put out. Um, I don't think there are, you know, there's lots of new independent bottlers that are out now, but when you talk to them, these guys are passionate about whiskey. They, they understand whiskey. They're not armchair bottlers that they, we had in the past. These guys absolutely love what they're putting in that bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, there's been a question from the audience. Um, uh, after a career as a, a whiskey ambassador, uh, what inspired you to make the jump to uh, the whiskey maker and whiskey blender part of the industry? Was that always oh. the plan or it just happened? Who asked that? Is that a plant? Is that James Bunton? <laughs> someone in Australia just trying to give me a fucking hard time. <laughs> um, okay. I, I don't think it was that um, conscientious or that planned. But I, I worked as a brand ambassador with Balveni. Absolutely brilliant job. Worked closely with David Stewart and Brian Kinsman. And in the later years in that role, um, you know, wrote a book and worked closely with David on this DCS compendium, this sort of legacy series of whiskeys that was pretty, or still is pretty groundbreaking in releasing oddities, you know, weird and, and wonderful rather than worried about consistency. So, I mean, David really had never had the chance to do uh, at length in his uh, career. So that was, that was awesome. But, you know, being a brand ambassador, Dave knows, uh, anyone watching knows who's um, a, a global brand ambassador means a lot of travel. I have a family. I've got uh, three, three daughters. And it was a trip. I was supposed to be home on a Sunday night. And I had told the kids, especially my, my middle one, Nora, I'll, I'll be home Sunday night. And it was something innocuous, like maybe Newcastle or Aberdeen, not like Taiwan. It wasn't a huge distance away, but still away is away. And I told them I'd be home. There was a flight delay, I think, from Aberdeen. I didn't get home until after they had gone to bed. And there was I came home. There was a drawing on the dining room table of my wife and Nora, who I was already referenced, and her sisters uh, at Kew Gardens and no daddy. And um, I know, I know. Well, it is a cliche thing. It wasn't because, oh, daddy's dead to me. I wasn't actually at Kew Gardens with him. So of course I'm not gonna be in the picture, but that just hit me like a knife. Like, what is the fucking point of this? It's right. just whiskey. Um, the family, you know, these, these are my children and I'm missing big parts of their lives. They're missing a connection to me. Um, there must be another way. So that's when I started asking around friends at, at, at some of the bigger companies, friends at some of the smaller companies. And I'd known uh, Justin and Ben and Tom, um, yeah, for almost 10 years uh, and asked them if they had anything. And then a few months later, they said, yeah, we'd like to bring you in and look at some whiskeys and do some stuff together. We did that for a bit. And then we said, this would be cool. Let's let's explore that. So, it was sad, though. I, I mean, saying I, I took a long time to say goodbye to William Grant because it really is. It's a family company, but it, it is a family company. You feel connected to everyone. It's a brilliant business. And it was very hard. It still is. I still miss elements of it. It was very hard to leave. Dave, with all you're talking about traveling around as a brand ambassador, uh, what are the trends that you're seeing in, in whiskey worldwide? Uh, obviously, there's been major changes in the last decade or so. Uh, any particular standouts? Oh, I haven't left this room for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, trends around the world. Um, I think more and more people certainly are certainly seeing in in Asia how how educated people are about whiskey. I mean, they know about whiskey uh, and they can tell you stories about distilleries that they've read in in books and everything. And um, much younger people are starting to explore it over there in in Southeast Asia, which I I really love. And I love the mixed demographics and not grumpy old bearded men like us here. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing the younger people exploring whiskey and you know whiskey has always had that image of a grumpy old man's drink and, and look at us <laughs> well no, but you're, that's such an interesting thing Dave I agree like so in Asia you, you would you agree that you see more well young people but also females at whiskey shows and whiskey 50 50 in Taiwan I would say yeah, yeah. yeah. it's Absolutely. noticeable yeah it is noticeable yeah very interested in whiskey and you know not not in the sense of what we're like here but interested in drinking it and talking about the stories and um not collect not so much collecting it but drinking it and putting it in highballs and cocktails and yeah not yeah. being afraid to do that kind of stuff which comes with none of, none of the stuffiness that we've inherited i guess yeah that's yeah. interesting and in uh, in australia we're seeing also a, a lot more a lot more women uh, uh drinking whiskey uh, they come to our shows uh, not only with uh, with partners, but as groups of women. Is that as, do you see that worldwide as well? Um, so not so much. In, there are shows in the UK that 
that do have that sort of element to it. But still, a lot of the whiskey shows in the UK are still, and certainly over Europe, is a lot of a, the, you know, the real geeky people that are into their whiskey rather than, I think what we need to do is change that, get that cocktail element into it. When you see a cocktail bar, a whiskey cocktail bar in a whiskey show, I think the demographic completely changes because now it's about fun rather than about, and this is what it is, whiskey is, is, it's a drink. It's fun. It's just a drink. It's you know we drink it for fun. Um, okay, we we get a little bit geeky about it. Um, we're passionate about it, absolutely. But at the bottom line, most people just drink because they enjoy a drink, and that's what we've got to get across, rather than this full-on blown geekiness that this distillery has a line arm angle of fourteen and a half degrees. And three years ago, they had to try it at 16, 16 degrees, and it was a different plate flavor. No, no, we have to get that out of the get in on a glass it's drink it yeah i'm not yeah i'm not sure that's the obstacle though dave i think uh, women um can get as geeky as guys can for sure I, I think the problem is 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 worse than that unfortunately um having witnessed it from both sides of a, of a whiskey stand and working with colleagues who were controversial to hire i i hired uh women in our ambassador team and it took some convincing i'm not going to lie to you uh, which is bonkers uh in this day and age um although it was i guess five years ago but still um so this uh what, what we witness, I think, at a whiskey show is is still a macho masculine culture. And if I was a woman going to a whiskey show, I would not only be intimidated by people assuming I know nothing, which is fucking offensive mm. because I'm a yeah. woman, but also being flirted with and, and just sort of being harassed after a few drinks. It just that's not what I came here to do. So if you look at uh, a normal whiskey tasting at, 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 a, at a specific bar or, or a festival um, and then look at a women's gathering, women come out to these whiskey festivals uh, in numbers and the w women in whiskey nights are massive. I, you know, where mm. I'm from in Toronto, there's one that's run at the Caledonian hotel by Donna. And I think they do it every week. And there's like 40 people every week. And so there are women who love whiskey. It's just women are too sensible to go to a room full of sweaty bearded men and be harassed and assume right. that they know nothing. And that's what we need to change. We just start being, nicer people to to everyone and to just be cooler about it i mean yeah let, let's geek out together but let's not assume that because there's a woman behind a stand she's there as a model or something what is it 1980 yeah <clears throat> well you know, i've seen that with my my you know working with my daughter as whiskey well, right. yeah cat works right from yeah, the beginning right. the amount of people that would try and, and you know want want a hug of my daughter you know oh, leave her alone she's, she's working here yeah 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 a few drinks inside people and they yeah they they lose any decency that they had. <laughs> yeah, now oh, the snacks are coming in. Got, got <laughs> snacks uh, 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 snacks is, the, is, the, is the hashtag. Now I've gone for a, a cheeky breakfast whiskey. Well, while, while your mouth's full of nuts, uh, Sam, I'll uh, ask that, uh, another question from our audience. Um, how do you plan your portfolio of releases and the range of, of, of distilleries that you bottle? Uh, is it based on um, a set plan or available uh, availability of mature casks? Up until recently, yeah, it had definitely been from question, availability of, of, of cask. Absolutely. Uh, there has been very little planning about, apart from finding, you know, finding, you know, we're not laying down stocks as, as an independent bottler. So our plans are slightly different from someone who lays down stocks and is tasting stock and thinking, yeah, that one's ready. We're buying ready, whis whiskey ready to bottle and um, we're tasting cask and then trying, yeah, now it's ready if we just, do this we're ready to go and so there has been very little plans with us it's all about availability finding the casks um you know and we buy whiskey from three sources the brokers the distilleries and a lot of our older scotch from private collectors so when they come up um and, and they're ripe for for bottling then then we'll do that we have just changed everything <laughs> we've just changed everything and we are putting some plans together yeah so um we yeah, will be as releasing a, a very well -timed as boutique. Question. Sorry, I'm just saying it's it's a well timed question for us, isn't it? Because I think yeah, when yeah. I when I got to Adam Brands in, in March uh, 2018, there wasn't really a strategy with boutique because boutique was healthy. Boutique did really well. Dave was out there telling people about it. There was a real, there is a real community of people who are super into the stories of each cast, a story about the vattings, a story about the whiskeys, a story about the labels. Really want to get into it. There's so much to engage with with boutique. But I think we got a bit lazy um, and and overconfident with that, and just put a lot of stuff into into bottle uh, to to go truly global. You know, from 
Taipei to Toronto, you can find a boutique you bought and that's, that's absolutely amazing, but with a lack of focus. And so now we're trying to focus a bit more and we're going to have, you know, nine or 10 releases on a theme and a few really special Scotch whiskeys as sort of headliners. And that's it sort of outturns the way the society that the Scotch whiskey society does it, or, or Douglas Lang does it. It just makes sense. And it's much easier for us too, because we can, make sure we have all the communication and all the information for the geeks who want to know it ready ready for them um as they want to know it. the the, the trade-off of course is that there's maybe a slower uh, drip supply and things get sold out but it's cool i mean i think um it, it's really exciting because we can start doing continue to do all the things that define boutique oddities weird things new distilleries distilleries you never heard of distilleries uh from tasmania that you know the spirit will never be seen outside Tasmania or whatever it might be other than in a boutique bottle. That's badass. And that's the kind of shit we want to get into. And that takes focus. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, and just, just on that, uh, uh, we talked earlier about that. Uh, the assumption is that most independent bottlings uh, are of Scottish distilleries. Uh, but I just look at uh, of the uh, 18 whiskies in our independent uh, bottling pack. One of yours is a, uh, a rye and the other one is an Irish whiskey. Uh, do you see that trend uh, evolving and uh, as, as more and more of these New World whiskey distilleries are out there, are they making casks available to the IBs? It's certainly something boutique whiskey have been engaged with for a long time. I think our first independently bottled American whiskey was 2014. That was our first non-scotch. But we've gone on bot bottled whiskey from all around the world. In fact, our latest set of releases that just came out last week is um, a series of nine world whiskies, not one scotch amongst them. So we've got our first Taiwanese whiskey, our first French single malt, our first G uh, Ellsburn single malt, single malt from America. So, I mean, we've got a whole range of them. Another Macamira, now Swedish, Swiss from Langerton. Um, yeah, just some amazing new world whiskies. It's something that we decided, you know, it, that it was... A uh, long time ago, we had to persuade the distilleries to come to us. Um, you know, can we take a cask off for you? Uh, now it's starting to come the other way around. Like actually, people are seeing the value of an independent bottler opening up their brand, their distillery, to a market globally. You know, I think we're their best brand ambassadors. We recently bottled some single malt from South Africa. Um no one's seen single malt out of, from South Africa, really outside of, of South Africa. They keep it all to themselves. So they, they only make a very, very little amount of it, but it is really great whiskey. So we bottled some um, free ships. I think we were the first independent bottler outside of South Africa. There was a club in South Africa that did bottle, um, but it has opened that market up and it's opened that market up to the company to say, actually, there are people interested in our whiskey. Let's do this small cask, small batch release for these clubs, for these enthusiasts. Um, so, I, yeah, I, you know, we put that, I think, nine, nine, nine global markets. So three ships across the world, all of a sudden, there's, there's three ships whiskey in China, in America, you know, and, and they've never heard of a South African whiskey in the States when I took it to Vegas. Um, yeah, what? A South African whiskey? Never heard of it. So I think we, you know, independent bottlers can open those markets up for these smaller world distilleries. And, and certainly when you look at, I mean, you go back to the Malt Whiskey Yearbook 2007 and look in the back there about world distilleries and then how many pages it's taken over now. The, the amount of distilleries are exploding around the globe. Yeah. The other thing I'd say on that, Dave, not to sound too self-important as a, as a business, but it is certainly part of our philosophy. We've talked about this a lot, Dave, but um, you know, back it up a sec. You know, the great distilleries of Scotland, we may not even know their names were it not for Johnny Walker investing in Cardew and um, if it were it not for, you know, like McPhail buying a bunch of new make from McCallum. By, by supporting a distillery and using it for your blends or for whatever it might be, in our case, world whiskey blend, um, but for using these, these, these whiskeys, you're, you're, you do have an opportunity, yes, like Dave said, to, to market these products and make them available around the world so that they survive 10, 20, 40, 100 years. Um, we, we know in Scotland, a lot of distilleries were lost who weren't owned by the big blenders or weren't partnered with the big blenders or who dared to stay independent and not be part of that. And, and yeah, we, we believe that we find an amazing distillery like Copperworks in the West Coast of the United States in Seattle um, 
we want to use that spirit for various purposes and be one of the partners as they as they grow. So um, it's sort of, it's sort of that it still is based in that Scottish tradition of of with a blender's hat on, I guess. Uh, we are independent bottlers, of course, but with that blender's mentality of um, the the rising ships, the more the more people we can uh, bring along with us, the better. Just talking about the global market. Uh the obvious elephant in a room that comes out at some of these events, uh, virtual events, is uh, COVID-19. And um, uh, obviously, six months ago, uh, uh, it was a different world and uh, different business plans that we all had for various businesses. Uh, how do you see the uh, your business and independent bottlers in general uh, now evolving in the, the new reality that we live in, uh, both from a supply and a consumer point of view? Uh, in terms David, of your marketing I, supplies, David, you've got a room that you don't want an elephant in. There, there should never <laughs> be an elephant in that room. There's going to be a major fucking problem. <laughs> oh, how have yeah. we changed? Well, I mean, Dave. First of all, I mean, someone like Dave's, you haven't been traveling for six months. We've we've created a lot of online content, done a lot of stuff together. We we amplified the podcast. We were doing afternoon teas, um, but that's that's not really necessarily tied to the whiskey or to any commercial game. That's just about the conversation and, and being able to connect with so many people around the world. Like right now, uh, a tasting like this, this seems so normal, you know, um, which is wonderful. I think I think eight months ago, this would have felt a little bit different. I uh, would have felt even more niche and we might've had fewer people tuning in. But now I tuned into, I was tuning into podcasts last night. I thought I was doing one late, um, tuning into live streams, uh, Desert Island drams, all, everything and it's it there's just so much information out there because we have i think because we have been locked down and this sort of uh digital realm these things that have been at our fingertips all this time we're finally making good use of uh, for many in many industries of course but certainly in ours and on the on the supply side availability of casks and uh, and, and and the production side is that yeah, going to be affected no, not, nothing for us has changed there other than, um, you know, I have a couple examples, I think, of a few casts that are housed at distilleries that were locked down. Um, so we haven't been able to pull those to bottle, but we just wait. That's fine. The whiskey's getting older. There's nothing to worry about. Um, some bottling lines and bottling halls, of course, were closed. Some warehouses were fully closed and still are, like I just said. Um, but most have come back on safely. Most can work at a distance. Um, and so we have we haven't seen a, a problem with it with on that front uh, yet. But I, I think of having spoken to a bunch of distillers and brokers, I don't think that is necessarily a fear. One strange thing, though, that relates to I think the first question you asked today um, is we have seen more ridiculous offers for casks. So a lot of people, I think, are trying to liquidate casks or bottles even that they bought for investment from some schmuck in New York or whatever. I, I, I think this this kind of thinking is dangerous um, for humans, for us to invest in. Don't view whiskey like that. View it as a drink first and foremost. If the value goes up, but you want to drink it at the end, that's fine. But to intentionally buy a cast, I hope to flip and make a guaranteed return of 30%, that not only um, is is not foolproof. I mean, that's not necessarily going to work for you, but also it could harm this industry that we love because it's inflating prices and fucking the supply chain up. So. Um, that we've seen, we've seen people trying to clear clear stuff from investment portfolios at stupid prices, where the answer is a polite no, fuck off. <laughs> and um, Dave, when uh, a customer would approach you, uh, say at a show, uh, um, hypothetically nowadays, um, and uh, ask you why would why choose uh, uh, an independent bottling uh, over a the same distillery uh, owned bottling. What is what is the Ooh. advantage? Um, yeah, generally, I would say you know if you if you get fall in love with an independent bottler, you'll fall in love with an independent bottler because you're falling in love with their passion for the liquid they're putting in the bottle because your your flavour profiles are going to align with what they're doing. Their that your thought processes are. I mean. The people, independent bottlers are not whiskey makers, or some of them are nowadays, but they're passionate about the spirit that they're putting into the bottle, isn't it? You go to any distillery in Scotland, even if they're owned by a big multinational company, the people who are making that whiskey are passionate about their spirit, about what they do. Uh, 
The other thing about independent bottlers is they can create those distillery profiles um, that you don't get from distillery owned bottlings. You know, everything from the distillery, unless you go to the distillery, everything's from either 40, 43, 46%. It's mass marketed. Uh, anything that's in the supermarket is generally colored with E150, which most independent bottlers don't. They don't chill filter because they can't afford one. Um, and so they just put it through tea strainers to get the big bits out. Um, and we bottle, you know, there are still 20, at least 20 distilleries. There were more a little while ago, but, you know, gradually these distilleries are coming online with their own brands. But there are still 20 distilleries in Scotland that do not have their own brand. You only find them through independent bottlers or maybe the Flora and Fauna series if it's Diageo. Mm. And it wasn't that long ago where you couldn't find a Kregelaki, you couldn't find an Altmore, you couldn't find a Royal Brackler or Macduff because everything went into a blender. It was only, they came online 2014, so not that long ago. Um, so independent bottlers give you that. Um, and over here, where, an el where else would you find a Copperworks? in the UK. You, you wouldn't. I mean, you'd have to go over to the US to find a copper work. So independent bot bottlers are bringing you whiskey from around the globe, um, but also giving those different profiles without compromising, you know, different, different ABVs. Uh, some of them are doing different finishes. Um, we don't. We don't do a lot of finishing apart from the whiskey in our glass. It's the only finishing at Boutique we do. Um, but yeah, you, you get those options, isn't it? It's different options. I think, Dave, while you were speaking there, I saw a comment come up here saying, love the honesty. And yeah, if you know me and you know Dave and you know our company, we we can, we are fully entitled to be honest. We kind of, we have no choice because that's the kind of fucking people we are. But I think, we, as you were just pointing out, Dave, that is, a, that is an advantage um, of independent bottlings and one reason why I choose them sometimes. But I, to be clear, I, I choose official bottlings all the time. I drink Highland Park 12, which I think is back on form now. I drink Lagavulin 16, it gets emptied, I buy another. So, you know, there's many standard bottlings that are staples in my whiskey diet. Um, but independent bottlers, the nice thing you find there is honesty, just as Dave was uh, saying, and as his commenter just said, you know that what's in, you, you're gonna, if you ask a question about what's in the cast, you're gonna get an honest answer. If you, there's there's no brand story to protect. We don't have to protect the story of McAllen or Glenfiddich or, or Balvenie or big brands. Uh, the story we have is in the juice, in the in the label, in our passion, as Dave said, that we can spread while speaking about this particular whiskey. And then, yeah, we don't we don't have a distillery style to protect. Um, you know, if you are releasing Lagavulin 16, it, it should taste the same way it tasted when I first bought it in 2002. Um, I would like it to, you know, so there's, there's, there's an expectation to keep that style up where if we find a strange 11 year old Lagavulin that tastes nothing like Lagavulin and actually is more like uh, a Kalila from the 70s. Well, wow, let's let's bottle that. We're entitled to and we're empowered to do it. So we do. Uh, you opened the door there, there uh, Sam, the labels, the boutique labels. Um, uh, who designed them and what were they smoking at the time? Um, <laughs> this, this, that, it's something that a lot of people are intrigued about. It's like, you know, how on earth do they come up with those labels? Well, oh. I know we've got friends at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in Australia, great organization, run really well uh, in, in your country. Um, similar to those tasting notes, I think. I was part of the, the uh, tasting panels when I lived in Edinburgh and we would sit around taste a few drams and, and throw out whatever bonkers expressions or memories that were evoked uh, by the by the whiskeys. And it's a, it's probably a similar thing, Dave, you can speak to this too, because we, first of all, the artist is Emily Chapel, um, based in Glasgow. Check her out because she, she's created some beautiful images, not just for us, but for, for political purposes, uh, but with always with a bit of fun and a bit of a wink. Uh, and she's just she's just a wonderful human being all around. Um, and our friend uh, Kat Spencer found her some years ago when Boutique was starting and, and brought her in to start doing labels. And we found that we could come up with an idea like, hey, let's have a Swiss resort where there's two people from Milroy's escaping on a cast saying, up yours, see you later, being chased by the owners of the distillery in a sort of James Bond style thing. We could write those words in an email and 30 minutes to a day later, get a painting like that from Emily. Wow. You know, she could, she could take our stupid idea, as you say, or this idea, like we just hit a bomb, um, whatever we, we added 
an expression about or some ideas about, she would make it into something real and tangible and interesting and beautiful. And so we've been really lucky with Emily Emily's skill and her artistic understanding of our silly brains. She's definitely in our head. Yeah, she she can she can work with the briefest of briefs now, and I've seen some of the briefs that she's worked with, and I think, how the hell did she just create that just like that? I mean, it is there's a touch of magic in there now, and because she's been working with us right from the beginning, um, yeah, each new label is just another work of art. It's a genius. She's uh, certainly up there. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll, our labels are that yeah I, I never thought of it like that some of the stupid names that the smws use you know and their tasting notes and you know their titles that's just as silly as our labels you know our labels tell a story that each of each of the labels tell a story sometimes the story is a pile of shite um you know just look at our altmore label our altmore label came out that's the one with the container ship the the great white shark and the dinosaur fighting and the container ship is en route to an out of con it's out of control to a burning oil rig i what's the what's going on there i have no idea but it, it can't you know, and, and how does it relate to altmore yeah, because then we didn't have anything interesting to say about altmore and our first altmore label came out way before altmore brought their first releases out and created the Foggy Moss stories and, and the lovely distillery stories about Altmore and the romantic scotch and the mist and yeah. Yeah, so we didn't have all that nonsense. So we created some nonsense. Our own nonsense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now you mentioned a few of the, the labels in that Boutique Whiskey Co's uh, portfolio. Uh, one of our audience have asked uh, and uh, can choose not to answer it. It's uh, the usual story about having the favorite child. Um, your, each of your favorite um, current boutique release? Oh, current boutique release. Crikey, that's a difficult one because that there's is. so many that I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love, when people say, ask me what distilleries am I, yeah, it's always those distilleries that you don't very often see bottled by, you know, they, they don't have their own brand. So Glen Tockers, you know, I love Glen Tockers, Linkwoods. And why do I love them? Because you very rarely get a bad one because they're all bottled by, in fact, you don't get a bad one. I don't think I've ever had a bad Glen Tockers or a Linkwood because they're all bottled by independent bottlers. And the only standard release is the Flora and Fauna, which is a great release anyway. You know, my cupboard's full of Flora and Fauna releases because they're from those distilleries that I don't often see. So I'm going to say, yeah, things like Dal Ewan's, Glen Tockers, and our Linkwoods, Linkwood, so just uh, you know, pull the cork and throw it, and off you go. Uh, to me, they're just um, so lovely drinking space items. Sam, yours? I would, I would be uh, similar to Dave and say, sort of the the flora and fauna, the undersung blending uh, malts of Diageo or Dewars. So Craig Ellicky, we have a batch seven, batch six, batch six and seven. They're totally different, but they're both absolutely stunning. Um, uh, and then and Dal Ewan. So I've got a 15 year old over there. This is the 20 year old. Uh, these, those two examples I should are also quite different, but both beautiful. Um, and so to be able to see, you know, casks, uh, see, you know, bottles of Dal Ewan that aren't full of caramel and, um, very limited and you never, you never really see them on a normal shop anyway, to have, to have Dal Ewan, I'm a, I'm a big fan of some, some of the blending malts, like the two I just mentioned. So I would probably say one of those. The other, the other thing is I know um, I've been a big fan of Copper Works. I've already mentioned them and Dave mentioned them too in the USA, a single malt distillery in Seattle uh, for years since they were brewers actually before they even had the distillery, uh, fans of the guys behind it. And um, we've been fortunate enough to, to bottle at Copper Works in our World Series. So that that's just a stellar whiskey with a unique flavor profile that I've never found anywhere else in the world. Um, we have some future ones uh, actually some from Australia that are some of the best whiskeys I've ever had um, that hopefully will be uh, in a bottle soon enough. Um, and then uh, there's a, there's a bottling we did. Uh, oh, actually Nantau. I mean, a Taiwanese whiskey, right? And Dave's got that here. I'm having uh, Nantau is an undersung distillery. You never really see it. It's always when you do see it, it's the, the whiskey exchange or some of these online retailers, it's sitting there sold out. Um, just a beautiful, yeah. Beautiful, it's a beautiful label. Yeah, gorgeous label we made. I have silly stories on there too. And the last yep. one I'd say is the Santis. I 
this is my second bottle. It's not cheap, but it's a crazy marriage of three different, or, you know, um, a successive maturation of three different cast types that ends up with a crazy intense flavor, but like a Ribena or some sort of concentrate, when you add water, it, it's, it's like juice. It's absolutely gorgeous. So there's too many. Yeah, sorry, that was a long answer. To... <laughs> yeah. What's my favorite whiskey? Normally the next one. The next yeah, one. Probably, that would have been quicker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's two other brands that are featured in our uh, uh, IB virtual show, uh, and I believe which are making their, their debut in Australia, the, the Darkness and the Aerolite Lindsay. Um, I, I'm personally, I'm curious about the name of the Aerolite Lindsay, um, <laughs> who came up with that. Um, um, but, uh, um, looking forward to really seeing what uh, people think of those when they try them in their packs. All right, Sam's just gone to get them. Yeah. The Aerolite is the first, was the first release, hey Jason, was the first release from the Character of Isla series. And Darkness is something that I've wanted on my portfolio for a long time because the original Darkness was was is boutique um you know we, we would we would hive off 50 liters of, of boutique whiskey one of the, our boutique releases and we'd throw it into one of these small especially made casks that we would have made uh 50 liter 50 liter 50 liter casks um and um we'd only ever get 100 bottles you know maximum release was a, was 100 bottles yet it'd be exactly the same Whiskey, like we'll have a 21 year old feta can and then a 21 year old feta can darkness. And I wanted them alongside each other. Not that I ever, very rarely did I ever see them alongside each other, but I just thought it had been, it would have been cool. It should have been the boutique darkness range, but that's just me because I'm a greedy whiskey bastard. Um, but the darkness is something we started a long time ago with, with boutique. Um, but now Sam has taken manufacturer, making our own continuous liquid. Of, darkness so we've got our own darkness well that was the biggest complaint certainly my complaint i i have been a customer of adam brand's stuff long before i worked there and like dave said darkness was what uh, it's a super fun um and and boutique thing because as, as exactly as you said it was off cuts from casks or a small portion 64 liters would be taken out of a cask of let's say like he said fetter cairn the rest of the fetter cairn would be put into boutique to get some cash back into the small independent business that we are and then we would wait three to six months while that Fetter Cairn sat in an octave becoming different than the other release we had and much darker and taking on new flavors. If you discovered that Fetter Cairn and loved it, the chances of you finding a bottle twice was next to none because there'd be like this one, 99 bottles, you know, 64 liters total after evaporation, whatever was left, that was what was left. So my biggest complaint and the biggest complaint I heard when I got here was it's too limited. Um, something so good we should get more so the first thing we want to do just to address that we never want to get rid of the single casks these limited editions that were the the genesis of, of darkness but we need to have something that's just an ongoing and i don't i don't have a full bottle because i tend to drink it and uh, my buddy neil who comes over regularly a local dad it's his favorite whiskey now um which is great he was a glenn farkless fan a mccallum fan and a balvenie fan and this is this is a balvenie double wood type of idea where you take whiskey that's a one type of cask put it into another but we took um because we're putting into the the, we're putting this whiskey into um, Oloroso octaves, smaller casts, really intense uh, hit of sherry. Uh, we want something meaty that can stand up to it, not something too delicate. So we chose a space side whiskey with worm tubs and partial triple distillation that we could, that we knew would stand up to that. A great, another great blending malt that Dave and I love uh, in independent bottlings as well. And when they end up with bottlings of the spirit in boutique uh, at eight years old, this is the classic age statement of mature old Highland whiskey in the olden days. Uh, still is, I think, full maturity there. Put it into the cast. It takes on this massive color and big flavor that you expect from Oloroso Sherry. So we just wanted to have something we could continually release as darkness so people would hear about it, more people would know about it. And then once we have that, people could explore into the limited editions. Uh, and this this month actually we have ard bags coming out in darkness we have uh, strathyla which is fucking cool because you rarely see that in an indie other than through mcphail um so we've got a bunch of really exciting balmenic which i love balmenic uh limited edition darkness is coming down the pipeline as well excellent and uh, um just one one question as well last week we had our uh, um australian uh, virtual whiskey show uh, again, 18 different whiskeys from 18 different distilleries. There's uh, probably close to 60 
active whiskey producers now in Australia with probably another, at least a dozen coming on board at the end of the year. Uh, in that pipeline, is there a boutique Australian release uh, coming up soon? <laughs> in the pipeline, I believe there is. Of course, series. who would? Yeah. We bottled uh, uh, one Australian distillery before, haven't we? We bottled some Overeem a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we had two batches of Overeem. Um, but yes, look out early next year. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything will come to fruition. We'll have our series down under. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit different than Scotch, I think, Dave. You probably agree. But we have um, our cast buyer, Felix. Um, we aren't really, it's not like Scotch where we get offered lists from brokers. We, we're really keen to build relationships with New World Distilleries. So like we've said, Nantau and Copperworks, we've already mentioned, um, Santis, Millstone, uh, the Zuidheim Distillery in Holland. And so every distillery we're working with in Australia, Fleuria or um, uh, Belgrove or Starward even, um, we're not in it for one cask here and there. We're in it to, to work together and have some mutually benefit beneficial relationship that could go long term because whiskey whiskey doesn't succeed in a short term vision in my opinion um, whiskey has to be done with forethought and with care and patience and so we've definitely taken that we've taken well over a year working with uh, some australian distillers uh, we've secured a bunch of sexy whiskey and yeah uh, i think it's okay to say um within the next year there will certainly be uh decent handful of some very interesting casts, some ones I just described, and ones from the younger distilleries, Kalara and such as well. So we're pretty pretty excited about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll watch that space. Now, just looking at the clock, we're getting close to our hour mark. Uh, um, we can carry on like this for, for hours, but uh, I know people I didn't tell you about this though, did I? Oh, yes, of course, yes, Aerolite, please. Yes. Let's carry on. Aer Aerolite. It's a good name because when someone Googles it, it won't bring you to whiskey. It goes to like luggage or something else. So that's good. Cause I think one of the, my favorite things about whiskey is the sense of discovery. <laughs> yeah. Airlight Lindsay is all about just the fact that um, harking back to a simpler time when whiskey was just whiskey and it did what it said on the tin, you know, 10 year old Isla whiskey. So this just says right on it, 10 year old Isla. That's an anagram of that. Okay. That's what the name is all about. The look is the same. The look is to be a bit classic old school, simple, because as we've seen with the proliferation of pop of releases from Isla distilleries and um, the increased popularity is really far-fetched names and concepts that get further and further away from what the liquid's about. I just saw a release that this, it's funny to say that on this Airlight Lindsay, we have a smoke breathing dragon hidden in the image. And we even make a mention about peat smoke breathing dragons on the label as a way to poke fun of these great stories that Bowmore or Ardbeg or the distilleries of Isla are putting out with their whiskeys. It's not a criticism of those whiskeys at all, but like, wouldn't it be whiskey? Wouldn't it be nicer if whiskey was just simple again, where this is a 10 year old Isla, this is a 12 year old Isla, this is a South Shore, this is a, this is a Bunahaven peated and just, and, and that's, that's it. Does what it says on the tin. The irony of this whole thing is Lafroy, I'm sorry, Ardbeg has just come out with a, whiskey that uses the phrase smoke breathing dragons. Have you seen this? Yes. yes, yes. So <laughs> yes. the thing, the exact thing that we're ri not ridiculing, but poking fun at, they've actually just come out with. And so it was probably in the pipeline when we, when we were uh, releasing this, they'd already thought of it. So we're predicting the future with, uh, with Adam Brown, but it's funny that, that that's what we need to do to sell whiskey. I don't think so, man. It's that, whiskey. People will discover it. I think it's okay to just have a, five-year-old Ardbeg without all the pomp and circumstance and crocodiles and fire-breathing dragons. So Airlight Lindsay is just for that. When you just, you don't want all the confusion or have to Google a Gaelic term to understand what you're drinking from Bunhaven. You just want te classic 10-year-old Isla rounded uh, type of drink. That's what Airlight's for. That, that place on the drinker's shelf for that everyday Isla. Fantastic. Now, uh, um, let's get back to our yeah, nah questions. Um, now, Dave, uh, um, we'll go back to your Charlie McLean story. Um, uh, a few people said, mm, nah. Um, you're in there? Yeah, that's a lot of bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of old, yeah, yeah, I made it all up. I wasn't uh, there. I wasn't <laughs> there. Um, no, I haven't even watched it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave. Not, I don't know if you know this, David, but uh, Batiki Dave is not a big movie watcher. Actually, he's never seen a full uh, fictional film. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, and Sam, uh, um, there seems to be a, a kind of a lot of support for the uh, um, your, uh, your your Narwhal story. Um, it's on the kimchi now. Let's uh, let's let's see. Um, what do they think? What do they think? Um, yeah, that they going yeah. Well, I am from Canada. I did spend time um, up in Nunavut. I'm paying their tongue. Um, there was a tragic accident where a friend of mine died and we did have a funeral, but we had no whiskey. So that's the only part of the story that's not true is we didn't actually drink whiskey. We just sat around and told stories and laughed. Um, and ate narwhal. That part's true as well. Oh, okay. Uh, I said the narwhal yeah. part was, was true. Okay. And, and, and soil fermented um, blubber that had been under this under the soil for a while which was like a fine cheese actually mm -hmm. right um okay um it's calling Dave out the there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. three the times one. now <laughs> uh, well sam and dave um thanks for being on our show and uh, kicking off our virtual independent bottler show uh, we look forward to the feedback on our app. Uh, remember, those of you who do have your packs, you can rate each whiskey in the app. Uh, that feedback is invaluable to the brands. It uh, helps them understand uh, what you think of their whiskeys. And uh, uh, just remember that uh, they are all available uh, to purchase through the app. Um, but uh, as we did say, all these independent bottlings, they are quite limited. Uh, so if you do find one that you like, you better get in quick. Um, we do have uh, a few more other virtual shows coming up before the end of the year. Uh, so keep a lookout for those in the, our social media posts and our websites. But thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you at the next show. Thank you for thank that, you David. Much. And can I just say to anyone tasting those amazing 18 whiskeys, if there's any questions or anything, Boutique Dave or Dr. Whiskey on all the social medias, feel free to ask. We are a small company and we do. And exactly as David just said, we do take feedback on board and we, we need it. We need that relationship, that yeah. communication loop. So please. Thank you for having me. I was just about to say that. Yeah, get in, get, get, talk to us on social media because we live there uh, and any questions, yeah, throw them at us. Yeah. Fantastic. Good morning to you guys and good night to everybody else. <laughs> Have a great Cheers, show. Have a great show, all of you. Cheers. Thank you.